I want to get started. I think most everyone's here. Uh, my name's Brian, and I'm an engineer at Quantopian, and I just want to introduce our speaker. So Tobias is a managing partner at Carbon Beach Asset Management. Um, he is the author of Deep Value, Why Activists, Investors, and Other Contrarians Battle for Losing Corporations. And he also operates the website greenbacks.com and singulardiligence.com. Welcome, Tobias. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Um, thanks very much for having me. It's, it's great that there's a, there's a huge turnout here today. Um, yeah, so I'm managing partner of a firm called Carbon Beach. Uh, we've got uh, outside investors uh, and we manage accounts for them across a variety of different strategies. We're mostly equities, long, short, and our focus is on takeover targets, activist targets, and uh, as we progress along, we'll become uh, activists ourselves. So these some of the books that I've written. Um, Quantitative Value came out in 2012. You may have may be familiar with that one. Deep Value came out in 2014. Concentrated Investing is coming out today or in the next week or so. Um, I've spoken at Harvard and Caltech and a few other places about these things. So today we're going to go through these five um, five ideas. Um, discuss exactly what deep value is, uh, what contrarian investing is, um, why a quantitative approach is a good one and simple but not easy, exactly what the acquirer's multiple is and then some of the, the hedging that we do. Um, Benjamin Graham is the father of value investing. He teaches this idea that intrinsic value is distinct from price. You can calculate intrinsic value. Um, the simplest way is sort of a book value approach. He uses this analogy, the idea that you're buying a corporate gold dollar for 50 cents or less and it has these strings attached. And our job is to sort of value the impact of those strings and work out whether we'll in fact get a dollar or whether we'll get 80 cents or 90 cents. Um, sometime after Graham wrote that, uh, very shortly after, John Burr Williams uh, gave us the definition of discounted cash flow, which is the idea that all cash flows from here until kingdom come of an asset can be discounted back to present day at a different rate, we can account for growth and uh, that's how we value any, any asset, but equities in particular. There's a civil war in value investing between kind of the guys who, who like the, the metrics like price earnings, price to book, price to cash flow, and the guys who actually go and calculate intrinsic value, including growth and other things like that. So the Buffett guys would say this isn't real value investing, it doesn't it doesn't have any relationship to intrinsic value. Um, it's true that this isn't necessarily intrinsic value, but there's a very strong relationship between fundamental measures and performance. And so this is just a study that we did over 33 years. Um, you can rank every single stock in a universe by a fundamental measure, price to book, price to earnings, price to cash flow. Then you find that the cheapest outperforms the next cheapest and so on down to the most expensive. Um, Greenblatt's little book describes perhaps the simplest quantitative value investment strategy that's out there. I think this is the, if you're going to produce a quantitative value strategy, this is the way to do it. So the reason that I like it is he started with the idea that Warren Buffett invests in a certain way. He looks for a wonderful company at a fair price. And he went and found the definition of a wonderful company as Buffett describes it. It's a high return on invested capital. Then he went and found definition of a fair price or a bargain price as Buffett defines it. He says operating income before interest and taxes and then enterprise value is uh, the best way of calculating what price you're actually paying. So he, he just equally weighted these two factors. There are lots of different ways that he could have dealt with it, but he, he, he did it that way. And uh, then he tested it over a short period of time, about 16 years, and he found that it did in fact beat the market pretty substantially. So in quantitative value, we went and looked at that independently. We, we evaluated the, uh, the magic formula, which basically means that, so there's a criticism often of these sort of strategies that they focus on smaller cap companies. So we evaluated it, which means that if it was a larger capitalization company, we put more of the portfolio into it commensurate with its, with its market capitalization, which is a pretty heavy penalty to pay. You wouldn't invest that way. But you do it that way to make sure that the, the factor is real. 
and uh, the magic formula does outperform the, the market pretty substantially. That's more than 3% over the full data set, which is uh, significant. But the really interesting thing is what happens when we devolve the strategy into its component parts. So you know it has that wonderful company part and it has that value part. So when we do that, what we find is that the value part contributes all of the return plus some, and the quality part detracts from the value part, which is totally counterintuitive. And that's one thing that's sort of a recurring theme through all of these um, value strategies, that they are often very counterintuitive. So this is just another approach that, that, uh, that I have taken. So all, all that this chart is, so you can take the two factors and you can, rather than 50-50, a 50-50 application, which is the magic formula, we can say 60-40, 30-70, 100% return on invested capital, which might be the Charlie Munger kind of approach, where he vastly prefers the wonderful side to the value side. And then at the other end is the acquirer's multiple, which is my metric, which is just the value metric stripped of everything else. And um, when you do that, I think it's pretty clear that any time you add a little bit of quality, you, you slightly reduce your return. So the best returns are generated by a pure value factor and any kind of addition. So the question I'm always asked is, is there some sort of risk-adjusted assistance from this? And the answer is no. The, the quality factor introduces more risk that, than would otherwise be there. The drawdowns are about equivalent. Welcome. No problem. So the other question I'm asked is why? Why does that happen? Uh, and the answer is mean reversion. And so this is a demonstration of mean reversion. Michael Madison, uh, he's a Credit Suisse strategist. He does this, uh, he updates this research every year, and so he, he looks back 10 years ago, we can rank every single company by return on invested capital, and we can put them into five buckets, and then we can track their performance of return on invested capital over the next 10 years. So he's been doing this for years and years and years. Uh, this is the one to 2011. They all basically look identical to this. And you can see, can you see that bottom line there? Yeah, so there's a... This is the very worst return on invested capital. It's losing money relative to its cost of capital. And you can see that by the end, it's slightly positive. And the very best, um, it's also slightly positive, but it's, it's collapsed a lot over the course of those 10 years. So that's why when you purchase those high return on invested capital companies, for the most part, there are a very small proportion of them that do tend to persist with the very high return on invested capital. The problem is that we can't identify prospectively which ones they're going to be. A lot of guys have tried quantitatively to do that. Michael Malbison has the best research on it, I think, and still hasn't been able to do it. So what we're often doing when we're buying the very cheapest stuff is we're buying those ones in that, that quintile at the very bottom, that fifth at the very bottom, that are getting the, the, the performance like that. So I'll go through some more. So Graham knew about this very well. He was asked at a... Uh, committee meeting into um, investing after, after, the, after one of the crashes on Wall Street. How do you kind of get these positions to work out? Do you have to advertise or what do you do? And he gave one of the all-time great answers, which is just that it's a mystery to him as much as it's a mystery to anybody else, but it's mean reversion. So this is another example of mean reversion. So con contrarians are people who expect, who rather than anticipating that a, a trend will continue, a contrarian expects that mean reversion will occur. So you expect that at, at a fundamental level and also in the price discount to intrinsic value. So this is um, de bon Thaler's pretty famous research. They took these two portfolios, um, they divided into 10 and they've taken the most expensive and the cheapest, they've separated them on price to book in this instance and then they looked at the earnings per share performance in the three years leading up to the portfolio selection date. And this is averaged over, over the full period of the data that they had to that point, which is only about 20 years. So you can see the undervalued portfolio, the reason that the undervalued portfolio was undervalued is the earnings have fallen about 40% to the index 100 on the, on the portfolio selection date. And the overvalued portfolio has seen its earnings increase very rapidly, which is why, which is why one gets undervalued and one gets overvalued. The interesting thing is what happens after the selection date. So what you're expecting is when you buy these, these 
uh, these companies that have had these exploding earnings is that these earnings will continue on and you expect that the earnings that have fallen will continue to fall. And what, what in fact happens is that there's this little turnaround where managers don't just stand there and allow the earnings to keep on going down and competitors don't allow earnings to keep on going up. Competitors come in and compete for those good earnings, the good earnings growth and uh, competitors tend to leave industries where they're not earning enough, they're not earning their cost of capital. So then the question becomes, could we go out and identify um, undervalued portfolio securities where the earnings have been falling? Or should we look for undervalued portfolio securities? Can we find amongst them some that have had rapid earnings growth? So this is actually nine portfolios, but I've identified the three that are most interesting. So Glamour is very expensive with a very high rate of growth. Um, high growth value is sort of a Buffett style stock, growing very rapidly but cheap. Contrarian value is growing much more slowly but cheap. And so these are statistics of the actual, um, of the portfolio as you can see. So the left hand side is the rate of growth in each one of those factors. And the right hand side of each column is the multiple applied to that, to that valuation. So. Um, you can see in the earnings growth, for example, Glamour's doing 18.7% compound over three or five years to that point, but you're paying almost 20 times earnings for it. High growth value, still very quickly growing at 17%, you're paying 6.3 times contrarian value, growing much slower, although it's still a very rapid rate of growth in this portfolio, um, but you're paying 6.5 times. It's a, the contrarian value is not more expensive, it's just that because their earnings are likely more anemic, um, the price to book is the best measure here. You can see that. So the price to book contrarian value is basically two thirds the price of high growth value. And as you'd expect, high growth value outperforms glamour. Any addition of value into that sort of high growth leads to better performance. But here's the here's the kicker. So the contrarian value is the one that outperforms them all. So you might think that you're buying these high rates of growth in earnings, cash flow, and um, and you're paying a little price for them. You're paying a low price and you're getting that bargain in the rough, but what actually happens is the best ones to target are the ones that are growing the slowest because you're getting that fundamental uh, mean reversion as well. This is another similar study. Um, Tom Peters wrote a book in 1981 called In Search of Excellence. He went and identified all these companies that were excellent as he defined them, and then he found these quantitative characteristics of them, and he he said, so the excellent ones, they have very rapid asset growth, they have very rapid equity growth, um, they're much more expensive, 2.46 times book versus two-thirds of book. Excellent returns on capital, returns on equity, returns on sales. So Michelle Clayman came along and she tested that and she said, well, I'm going to put together an unexcellent portfolio, which will be the reverse of everything that he has identified and you'll also get it much more cheaply. And you can see that the unexcellent portfolio has massively outperformed the excellent portfolio, which actually underperformed the market. Except for that little bump in 2000. So what occasionally happens is that the market um, turns upside down, which is why it's very hard to run long short portfolios this way. Does it help uh, to be in um, the excellent portfolios during bad periods? So the, the shaded areas are economic growth, global economic growth below average. It's not necessarily a, a recession, but it's sort of, it's the worst periods and there's, it, there's not, it's basically random. You're better off being in the, in the unexcellent portfolios most of the time. Uh, this is the argument, this is the classical argument for quantitative approaches to investment. There's a very large body of research outside of investment for applying these rules. Basically, this is a study conducted by a doctor. He found that when uh, patients presented to a psychiatric hospital, it was very difficult to determine at first instance whether they were psychotic, which means you've broken from reality, or depressed, which can manifest as psychosis. So he had, uh, he had these psychologists uh, make their estimation, and then seven days hence, you could, you, could, uh, you could make a second diagnosis that would be more accurate. And then he looked at the rate of accuracy. So, Best psychologist getting it right about two thirds of the time. Average psychologist about 60% of the time. So he created this simple model and had six questions on it and through the back test of sort of him flipping by hand through these, through these uh, entry and 
and final uh, diagnoses, he created something that was right 70% of the time. So that means it's got a known error rate of 30%, but it's right a lot of the time. And then he handed them out to basically students, which is the inexperienced uh, psychologists and clinical psychologists who are the people who are actually applying these things. So without the benefit of the model, the inexperienced, this is students, they're getting it right about 59% of the time. Clinical psychologists were getting it right about 64% of the time. When they were given the model, both of them improved substantially. So the inexperience became better than a clinical psychologist who was actually so a student outperformed a clinical psychologist. The experienced guy started getting it right 75% of the time. But this was the really striking thing. Through, this, through the actual test, the model outperformed everybody else. So what that means is that the psychologists were exercising their discretion to override the model and getting it wrong. And the reason for this is this idea called the broken leg uh, phenomenon. You have a model that predicts whether somebody goes to the theatre on a Friday night. and you, you can factor in the weather, the temperature, what's showing. And so you have a pretty good estimate whether he goes to the theatre or not. Uh, you learn that he's broken his leg, which is information that's not contained in the model. So surely you should be allowed to use that additional piece of information to override the model, which is what all investing is. We find these situations that don't exactly fit the model. And the answer is that you should not. And the reason is that we find too many broken legs. It's particularly apt if you're a deep value investor because all of these companies have uh, problems, which is why they become cheap. So you have to ignore the particular problem of the case that you're looking at and focus on the experience of the entire cohort, know that you're kind of operating probabilistically rather than deterministically. And this is a golden rule. This is not only for investing, this is for the entire uh, area of study. Basically, simple models outperform experts, and they continue to do so when experts have access to the model's output. So you know Google... You have to look at the experience of the entire cohort. You have to trust that. So you just probabilistically most of them will not go out of business? Yep. Most of them will mean revert. We have, you know, we have lots of different uh, analyses that we can do to make sure that they're not frauds, they're not um, earnings manipulators, they're not uh, in financial distress, so they're given enough time to kind of survive through whatever period they're going through. But I mean, so the thing I was thinking of is the Blackberry. Is the what, sorry? Like Blackberry. Yeah. Like Blackberry will eventually go out of business. Yeah. Because it's been taken over by companies with better technology. Sure. And there are lots of other businesses that... Like that. But the approach, the, the, everybody will approach those stocks and ignore those stocks. There is a price at which they become too cheap. There are no bad securities. There are just bad prices for those securities. Some bit, Blackberry, the, uh, the, the story may not be written yet on Blackberry. It may not be over. It's still, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's not cheap enough to, top, to pop up in our screens. So I don't really know specifically Blackberry. But that's the, that's the question that everybody confronts when they look at these stocks, which is why when you go to buy these things, it's very difficult. It's, you need to have a quantitative approach to them because you can look at these stocks and they all look terrible. But as a portfolio, they do outperform. Uh, we, we, don't buy, we don't own Blackberry, but... Um, it could, we could have purchased it, I think, at, di at different periods. Um, these are the little Google cars that are driving around, and everybody's concerned that they, they get behind the wheel and the Google car is going to um, going to kill them. But the, I, I just like this this line from Google, and the, they said that the hurdle is not perfection; they've just got to outperform us, which I think is is possible. This is Rennie Magritte's. Uh, this is not a pipe, he's being very clever. It's a painting of a pipe. That's his point. This is a picture of a painting of a pipe. The idea that I'm trying to communicate here is that we always have to remember that the model is an abstraction from the thing. It is not the thing itself. So the DCFs often have um, built into them an assumption about returns on invested capital, multiples at the end. And tweaking those assumptions uh, only a very little bit can change the intrinsic value quite substantially. 
And so if your model has built into it this expectation of extrapolation of trend or earnings, it's likely overestimating the intrinsic value of the stock. So I like to apply the 80-20 rule, which um, you can turn into the 64-4% uh, rule. So 4% of the effort gets you 64% of the way there. And you can continue on until you're basically doing no effort, 1% of the effort for, I think that becomes almost 50% of the outcome. But the basic idea is that um, the model has to be useful to you. You can't continue to grow the model so that it becomes so big that you kind of miss what the drivers of the actual valuation model are. Because often there are a few big muscle movements in the model. So for us, it's the acquirer's multiple. It also has to be concrete. So this, there's another famous study where they get two gentlemen to sit in a room and they're shown pictures of cancerous cells or, or healthy cells and they're asked to determine whether the cell is healthy or not. One guy gets correct feedback about his answers. The other guy gets the feedback from the gentleman to the left. So the guy who gets the direct feedback starts coming up with these very concrete rules for um, what's happening with the cells. He can figure out a short list of concrete rules, you know, the edge is broken or it looks a bit sick, something like that. The guy, in the, the guy who's not getting the good feedback, he starts coming up with these really complicated rules and he gets lots and lots of them. And he doesn't perform as well, naturally, because he's, he's not getting the good feedback. The really interesting part is when they get to meet at half time, they talk to each other about their rules. The guy who's got the simple rules is kind of impressed by the, the really complicated rules of the other guy. And he starts thinking that he should include those more complicated rules in his model because they're clearly much more impressive. And of course, his performance goes down as a result. So this is the acquirer's multiple, very simply. Uh, it has uh, enterprise value on the top there. So enterprise value is market capitalization plus all of the things that you would have to pay as an acquirer of the business to take it, to take it private. So you've got to pay for the debt, pay for the preferred stock, any minorities, cash, unfunded pension liabilities, so on. Doesn't really matter what you put on the other side, operating earnings, EBITDA, EBIT, EBIT minus CapEx, they all give you approximately the same answer and they all tend to outperform. So you can see there's the acquirer's multiple, which is EBIT, EBITDA right beside it. It's statistically identical. Um, that sort of difference is not much. Gross profits is gross profits yield is the third best performed there. That's literally revenues minus COGS over the same uh, enterprise value. It's outperformed over the full period. It also works internationally uh, in every single one of these markets. The red line is um, the US, but you can see that it's, it's statistically significant and there is a value premium, which is the difference between the best and the worst averaged over the full period. It continues to be very unpopular. So you can see that's enterprise value on EBIT, which is the, the acquirer's multiple on the far right there. It's one of the most unpopular um, multiples, factors out there. And you can see higher OE continues to be very, very popular, uh, even though it reduces returns. Part of that is because there's sort of a, there's a, a slight stigma attached to value sometimes, I think. I do these value, uh, the, the value conjugations, I call them. I'm a value investor, you buy cheap stocks. He's a bottom feeding junk collector. Part of the reason that it persists though, this opportunity, is that it goes through these periods of underperformance where the most expensive stocks outperform the least expensive stocks, which is, which is not what you would expect. So for a very long period now, this is a 10 year period it's been underperforming um, both the market and the more expensive ones. And you see, that, you see that reflected in individual value investors. So Buffett had a bad year last year. He was down 12.5% underperformed the market. Einhorn's had a bad kind of 10 years now. He was down 20% last year. And Ackman uh, had a bad year too. So you can point to all of the individual mistakes that these guys have made and Dan Lobbs had just recently, it's not in my perform it's not in a presentation, but he's, he was long, Allegan, he had 23% of his fund in Allegan, which has been smashed to smithereens with the... You can find the individual reasons why each of these portfolios underperform, um, but really it's just, it's, a, it's an issue with, with, with value for whatever reason, it's, it hasn't been performing. So this is one of the things that I like to do. Um, we, uh, we hedge portfolios rather than, so long short doesn't really work 
uh, for value. There are other ways that you can you can find companies to short, but it's just not our expertise to short that way. So where where somebody requires some hedging, we do it uh, by shorting an index. And I'll just go through how we do that. So the market is expensive at the moment. Uh, cyclically adjusted price earnings is 26.1 times against an average of about 16.6. So the red line is how expensive it is. The yellow line is the average. You can see that um, it's been expensive for an extended period of time, since sort of 1996, which is coming up in 20 years. We're 60% of the long run cape at the moment. And there's a pretty tight relationship between where cape is and the implied returns that you get from that. And they have been, it, ha it has been quite predictive. To the extent that it overshoots or undershoots, it tends to tell you whether you're currently in uh, a bubble or not. So you can see that in 2000, which is the kind of the blue on the far right, the blue one where it doesn't stick so closely to the, to the red line, that was, that was the 2000 <laughs> bubble. We're in another kind of little, little bubble at the moment. But, um, it's underperformed. So we've, got, we've had 6.7% per annum for the last 10 years against a very long run average of about 8.9%. These are total returns. And it's predicting about 3.8%. So this is, I should say, this is this is based on a model that John Hussman builds. This is my version of the model. So the difference between my version and Hussman's, mo Hussman's model, I use Hussman's algorithm, which assumes mean reversion in the valuation over 10 years. Um, he puts in, he, he puts in a, uh, a median, he, he assumes mean reversion back to 15 times CAPE. I use the actual 16.6 uh, .6 times average. That's one difference. He assumes a growth rate of 5%, and I assume a slightly higher growth rate of uh, 8.9 minus the current dividend yield, which is 2.1, so it's 6.8 at the moment. So mine tracks a little bit more closely, I think, because it uses the actual figures from the data set rather than uh, assumptions, um, but it's still his model. But to the extent that there are any differences between the two, because I've been in, he, he said last time that I had his model wrong, that he saw it. Uh, to the extent that there are any differences there, mine, and that's, that's why there's some difference. Um, so this is from the peak March uh, 24, 2000 was the peak of the stock market. Um, these are the nominal returns. You can see that basically it's underperformed until quite recently, until 2013 for the S&P 500, which is the index we track. And it's up about 34%, which is about 2% compound since March 24, 2000. That's the absolute peak. Um, the reason that we don't use the valuation of the market as our predictor is value tends to be quite idiosyncratic and it performs differently. So be, it's been down quite substantially over the last year, but it's been up quite substantially over that full data period, over that full data set. So if you said, well, the market's expensive in 2000, I'm not going to invest, you would have missed out on kind of... This is the decile of the S&P 500. So these are very big companies, eminently investable. You could have got 14% compound. This is on a quarterly uh, rebalance. Um, but you've had to endure these big drawdowns uh, on the way through. It was down 33% in, um, in 2000 and 2002, but 50% for the market. Then it was down more than the market in 2009. It's down 62% versus 56%. And it's drawn down 30% in the most recent. So where the market was down 11% to... Um, to February 11, the, uh, this is a value composite was down kind of 30%, which is very substantial. So one way of, one way of avoiding these is, a, is using moving averages. Um, the effect of moving averages is typically not to outperform whatever index you're using, but it does tend to cut the very big drawdowns, which is what we're trying to avoid. The quid pro quo for missing very big drawdowns is you get these whipsaws. So a whipsaw is where you're instructed to hedge by the model, you put the hedge on, and then the market goes up, and so you, you, you lose money. And that's why you slightly underperform the, model, the, the underlying asset over the full period. Um, and the reason that you would do that, though, is you cut off these gigantic drawdowns, which means you can lever into those positions so you can get the same volatility as the underlying asset without the big drawdown, and you get, therefore, better performance over the full period. So you get better risk-adjusted returns without, without the drawdowns. The yellows are whipsaws, and the big arrows, red and green, uh, were correctly uh, identified a big drawdown or a big run-up as well. 
So we can divide um, the universe, uh, the time, time period data into these four groups. Basically, it's cheap on a CAPE basis, which means it's below average on a CAPE basis. It's expensive on a CAPE basis, which means it's above the average. Or we use the 10-month moving average to determine whether the trend is up or down. So you can see from this, clearly the very best time to be invested is when the trend is up and the market is cheap. But that's generated 15% per annum. Over a full data set, that generated 8.6% per annum. So it's almost double. Um, you can see that it's also, if the market is expensive but the trend is up, it's still a very positive return. It's still worth being invested in that, um, in that asset. Uh, cheap but down is slightly worse, which I always find a little bit surprising. And the very worst time to be invested is when the market is down and it's expensive. And so these are the reasons why uh, the drawdowns become much, much worse. So the returns are sort of there or thereabouts. If it's down and expensive, you get negative expected returns and an expected gigantic drawdown. This is the worst one, so that was 2009. Um, down and cheap also was a very bad drawdown. But up, um, pretty reasonable, 17.7% is not that bad. Up and expensive, 0.3%. Not that bad either. So this is just the four, um, the four portfolios that we were looking at before as they've performed over the full data set going back to, uh, I think this is to 1950. So obviously you want to be in the cheap and undervalued, that's the green line at the top. But you can't invest only when those periods are, are there because you spend 20 years at a time out of these um, assets. Blue is expensive and up. And you can see that there was a very long period, sort of starting in the uh, mid-1990s, where the market has been expensive and up, and you could, have, you could have done quite well through that period. So we try to combine them together. And what we do is um, we use our hedge. We use the, the moving average on our hedge, and we leave our long portfolio fully invested in the undervalued stocks. And so what we're trying to do is avoid the big drawdown and... Um, uh, where the, where the hedge is on, we're also seeking to get a little advantage over the market. So we should generate a little positive return um, to the extent that value outperforms um, the, the, the index that we're hedging. So you can see, this is, this, is from the, this is the same as we ran before, from the very peak, March 24, 2000. Um, there was a big drawdown in the early 2000s and we were very positive through that period. This, this is a back test, so this is not our portfolio, this is a back test. But you can see that the yellow line is the, he is the hedged portfolio. And it has two nice things about it. One of them is that it has slightly outperformed by 1% compound over the full period, which ends up being um, fairly substantially ahead. And it's had low, much lower drawdown, so it didn't draw down really at all at the beginning of the 2000s. It had half the drawdown in the most recent 2007-2009 uh, drawdown. Um, but through this most recent period where value has slightly underperformed, the drawdown has been a little bit more substantial. So just as an indication of where we are right now, um, the S&P, so we're, we're currently in the up and expensive, as you'd expect. Um, the trigger for the 200 day or the 10 month moving average is 2017, which would make it down and expensive, which is the very worst uh, quadrant to be in, which would expected return of negative 6% and a big drawdown. Um, so I'd like to open it to questions if you have, uh, yeah, yes sir. Can you go back to the Do you want to see the drawdown? Are you looking for the drawdown or are you looking for the... Do you want, this is, this is the drawdown, does this make it easier to see? You're saying where it drew down and the market didn't draw down at all? Oh, so this, this is the easiest chart to see it on. Yeah, so the, um, it's, you're talking about sort of in about 2011, 12, that there's a, there's a draw. Very recently, very recently, very recently, 2014 to present. It doesn't hedge, it follows the market. straight down. So 
you're looking at, yeah, it's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit harder to see. Oh, this, it's probably easier to see on this one. What actually happened is um, value started underperforming in about May last year. And so value started drawing down and the hedge didn't go on until 1 January this year. So this is, that's not actually the, that's not the hedge underperforming, that's value underperforming. And so that's one of the problems with, it's kind of, it is a little bit idiosyncratic. So this drawdown is, is the bulk of this drawdown is value underperforming, not the market. So the same thing happened in, you can see in, uh, if, you, if you look back to sort of 2007, the same thing happened. Value actually drew down very substantially before the market did. And then when the market drew down, the hedge came on and it basically tracked sideways and started recovering. It was recovering well before the market bottomed and it would have been back to square at the time the market was reaching its bottom. So it's, a, it's sort of uncorrelated, which is something that's, that's very attractive to investors. Um, I fully expected in this most recent drawdown that when the market started drawing down, that's great for our hedge because we start making money on that side. And um, the market turned around, sort of bounced really hard from February 11, and our hedge is off right now, which sort of surprised us. We sort of thought we were, we were getting ready for another 2007, 2009 type type drawdown. Yeah, value is an idiosyncratic kind of beast that doesn't necessarily track the market that closely, which is why it's, it's often, if you're an asset gatherer, you don't want to be a value investor because you have these periods of underperformance. But if you can persuade people that it's worth it for the additional return and they're prepared to lock their money up for a period of time, it's, it, it is a better strategy over three, five, ten years. Thanks. Yes, sir. Um, there are lots of people out there who like value investing, who understand value investing, who are who understand that they will outperform and they don't have any sort of in urgent need for the money. And so, um, you know, we're not really talking to people who aren't interested in investing in value investors. So my, you know, we're always talking to guys who understand that that's the case. But I, I like to show them these just so they can understand that it's not a theoretical risk. It actually does happen regularly, and, and it's quite substantial. And it's not any mistake on our behalf, it's just um, that's, what the, that's what the strategy does and there's not much that we can do about it. Thanks very much folks. If you'd like to get in, if you'd like to get in contact with me, these are my contact details um, on LinkedIn. I check that once a, once a month. So <laughs> email's the best way. Per year, compound, yeah, yeah. So that's the when I'm looking at the, those are the compound returns. So I'm just looking at you know one end, the end point versus the starting point, and then the, the compounding over. The, so it's a geometric average rather. Yeah.